Okay, folks, the word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow is a critic of the thoughts and intents of the heart. All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be mature, thoroughly furnished into all good works. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We're going to take just a moment of time to prepare ourselves for the study of God's word through the technique of rebound and operation recovery, which includes a rebound and operation cry. So with your heads bowed and eyes closed, you make your own way with the Lord through the confession of your own personal sins. I will close out our prayer time and pick up our study right where we left off last week. Make your own way with the Lord. Father, we thank you this morning for the privilege of studying your word once again. It's a daily matter of uh, taking the word of God, applying it moment by moment, moment by moment, making sure that we've made the right adjustments to your justice. It's, uh, it's a great day to be alive. Uh, pressures all around from, from all kinds of directions, but your word has made sufficient, sufficient grace provision for us, no matter what the circumstance we face. And this I pray in Christ's name, asking each of us to be aware of um, our own lives, be aware of the lives around us, and make that, make that movement, those moment by moment transitions into adjusting our life and our lifestyle to the Lord Jesus. Father, I pray this in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. You know, uh, just a thought before I before I move on to our uh, to our study. You know, every one of us are making adjustments uh, to our life or should be making adjustments. And I want you to know that in terms of spiritual growth, I have areas of my life where I'm working on just like you are. And uh, it's not as though we have all arrived just yet. But we're on that we're on that path of moving toward the goal line, and I don't think we should ever look back. God has made sufficient provision for us, so let's move on together. Uh, our study is actually in Ephesians chapter two, verse two, part five, and we're actually dealing with Matthew chapter twenty three. Now remember, Matthew twenty three is actually uh, is actually a a passage where Jesus is talking to a crowd as well as his disciples. But as, as we're taking a look at Ephesians chapter two, we see Paul continuing time after time after time, telling Christians about why the age of grace has come on the scene, why, why God has provided uh, provision for us as Christians to carry out his plan because of Israel's failure. And when, when we went through the book of Acts, we saw time and time and time again, Paul lamenting, brokenhearted, concerned about the, the salvation of Jews who had failed to see Jesus Christ and recognize him as their Messiah. Well, while we're looking at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, part 5, we're actually, we're actually in that age of grace information, but Paul is reflecting back again to the Ephesians and the crowd that would receive this this letter as it as it went around the region he's he's informing them as to why god had chosen gentiles now to carry the word of god to the world now let me make an announcement or two before we move on from there our next uh, bible study fellowship luncheon number five will be on january 26 that's a that's a sunday january 26 at american pie pizza please mark your calendar to uh, make sure you don't miss that event. There will be no class this coming Wednesday due to New Year's. Now, let's move on then to our document because again, we see Paul talking to the believers in Ephesus through the letter regarding, um, regarding Israel. And here's the issue. Why in the world, if, I'm, if we're talking about Israel, why, are we, why am I even talking about this to you? 
Well, the truth of the matter is, is that while the primary application was to the Jews in Israel, the truth of the matter is, is this same information has a secondary, has a secondary application to you and me. And we'll see that as we go down. Because what we're talking about is religion versus spirituality. Well, we're in verse 8 today, but I want to rehab, recap for just a moment. In verse 1, Jesus was speaking to his disciples and the crowd in Matthew 23. See, we're in, we're in Ephesians 2, 2, verse 2, but we have gone back for a minute into uh, to, um, the, age of, uh, the age of Israel to pick up something that Jesus was talking to the disciples about because he is going to he is going to absolutely knock religion in the head and we need to make sure we understand this so Jesus was speaking to his disciples and the crowd of people that were there with him at that point in time moving on into verse 2 we find that Jesus is going to describe this describe the scribes and Pharisees as legalistic and religious now, let me point out something as we as we use various terms in our in our study, we need to not only know the term, we need to know what it means and how it applies. So if you are called biblically, if you are called legalistic or you're called religious, that is not good. That is an attention getter. And we need to make sure that we're able to distinguish between religion and spirituality. So Jesus is going to describe in this passage, he's going to describe the Pharisees and the scribes who were the leaders at that point in time in Judaism. He's going to describe them as legalistic and religious. In, point, in verse 3, Jesus is going to indicate that while, these, while the scribes and Pharisees are the professors, they are the leaders, they are the religious leaders in Judaism, he's going to tell these people they are incompetent. Now, I think what we need to understand here today is this, that when you're talking about Christianity at, as, as a spiritual way of life, we need to realize that it's not being practiced that way. And it's because of a failure of the pulpit. Guess what? That's what we're talking about here, a failure in the leadership in Judaism, we have failure in leadership in Christianity today, and as a result of that, we've got Christians that don't have a clue about anything regarding a spiritual way of life or how to live out the Christian way of life as it is designed by God's plan. So he calls them legalistic. He calls them religious. He calls them incompetent. And in verse 4, he's going to call them hypocrites. We'll see something about that in a moment. In verse 5, this we find out in verse 5, 6, and 7, we find out what is motivating these legalistic, religious, incompetent, hi uh, hypocritical scribes and Pharisees, the leaders, remember? Well, the scribes and the Pharisees were motivated, Jesus said, by their lust to excel. Boy, I just want to get to the top, okay? Six, the scribes and the Pharisees were motivated by their approbation lust. They were, they were lusting for approval, not just from God. They wanted approval for, from everyone that they came in contact with. Verse 7, the scribes and the Pharisees were motivated by their lust for power. Power lust. Well, we see that today. Here we go. Jesus is describing the scribes and the Pharisees as legalistic, religious, incompetent, hypocrites, lusting to excel, lusting for approval, and lusting for power. Now, what I've done is I just sort of summarized those, and I just did that. And what we could do is just take a look at that list very quickly and see again, in summary fashion, what their problem was. Legalistic, religious, incompetent, hypocrites, lust to excel, approbation lust, power lust. Now, we're moving on then, after having reviewed verses 1 through 7, now we pick up verses 8 through 10. And what we see then is in verses 1 through 7, we've just, we've just given a, a summary of verses 1 through 7. Now what we want to do is to take a look at verses 8 through 10 and notice that little diagram I have. As we're, as we're studying down through verses 1 through 7, we've just seen all that Jesus had to say about the 
uh, about the scribes and Pharisees, how he described them. But in verses 8 through 10, we have what would be actually better understood as a parenthesis. And then in, once we get through verse 10, 8 through 10 is the parenthesis. Then in verses 11 through 39, the rest of the chapter, Jesus continues to go on and condemn religion. Okay? In verses 8 through 10, then, we have an aside. We're going to move away from verses 1 through 7 and pick up this little subject out here in verses 8 through 10. And what we see in verses 8 through 10 is that Jesus is going to give his disciples some advice in the following verses. Okay? So in verses 8 through 10, we're going to see some of that. And here's what we're going to see in verses 8 through 10. We're going to see that God the Father's plan is centered. Uh-oh, it is centered in the person of Jesus Christ. It is centered. God the Father's plan is centered in his son, Jesus Christ. Now, let's take a look then at verse 8, and let's pull this thing apart, okay? Remember again, we're talking about Jesus condemning religion. Therefore, this is not just another nice Bible study. I am teaching the way of life for a born-again Christian. God does not want religion. Religion is condemned, whether it's a, whether it's a, a world religion or whether it's Christians practicing Christianity as a religion, God is condemning it. Verse, verse 8. Remember again, the Father's plan is centered in the Son. And verse 8 says, But do not be called rabbi. For one, capital O now, for one is your capital T teacher, and you are all brothers. Now remember, he's talking to the crowd and his disciples basically who are jews again there is a there is a secondary application to the to the christian way of life don't call anybody rabbi there's one there's one teacher capital t and you and i we are all brothers just like the jews were all brothers okay now let's take a look at that word rabbi uh he said but do not be called rabbi the word rabbi actually carried authority, the authority of a teacher. Now stop right there. The word rabbi carried the authority of a teacher. Now notice what it says up here. Do not be called rabbi. One is your teacher and, and you are all brothers. <clears throat> Secondly, knowing then that the word rabbi carried the authority of a teacher. And I listen, it, it's amazing. We have people online with us right now who in the past have been teachers in public school systems. Maybe you have been a teacher somewhere else. Maybe you've been a pastor teacher. Maybe you have the gift of teacher, whatever. When you are a teacher in a classroom, you are the one with authority. And I tried to indicate to people in my, in my book, it was uh, uh, called uh, Christianity in the Home Environment. And we were, and we we actually applied that not just in the home, but it can be applied in a school system. So, for example, in a classroom, like right now, in a classroom, this is why oftentimes when we when we look uh, at the uh, the participants, I make sure or try to make sure that I don't forget to mute everyone on entry into the into the uh, to the program, because if it doesn't. In the background, we hear the TV, we hear the radio, we hear the dogs barking, we hear this, we hear that, we hear conversation. And sometimes, if they have their camera on, we see somebody walking across the screen in their night clothes. Well, guess what? That becomes a distraction. And in a classroom, that's what we're at the setting. We could do it in a job or someplace else. But in a classroom setting, for example, the teacher has the right to teach and the students have the right to learn. But if somebody is disrupting, then the, then the teacher has lost the privilege of teaching and the other students have lost the privilege of learning. So there must be authority and the teacher must take the authority in the classroom if in fact the school system will allow them or the deacons will allow them or whatever, okay? So the idea here is the word rabbi carried the authority of a teacher. And a rabbi was one who had the final authority. Guess what? 
Jesus said, but do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher, and you are all brothers. So the idea here is there's one has, who has final authority, the teacher, and guess what? Jesus Christ was the final authority. Now look what I've done. I capitalized and emboldened and underlined the phrase at that time, and I underlined rabbi, Jesus Christ, and at that time. So what we're saying is during the age of Israel, when, Jan when Jesus was walking on planet Earth, he was the rabbi, not that guy over there, not that guy over there, not that guy over there. He said, excuse me, do not be called rabbi for there is one, capital O, who is your teacher, capital T, and you are all brothers. Now, here's the issue in point two. Rabbi, Jesus, was the one who had the final authority. At that time, that is during the age of Israel. Jesus was speaking to his disciples in verse 8. That's what we're talking about. When we, when we take this in Matthew 23, we make an application, a primary application. Jesus is talking to his disciples and says, excuse me, somebody just called you rabbi over there. No, no, no. Don't allow yourself to be called rabbi. There is only one teacher, one capital O, capital T teacher, and that is me. That is while he was on earth. Now watch this. This was spoken by Jesus while he was on earth. You know that he came. He was born of a virgin. Later in his life, he, mount, he mounted the cross. He died spiritually, died physically. He was buried. 40, he was resurrected three days later. Forty days later, he ascended into heaven. And, and ten days later, we had the day of Pentecost when Peter was offering the kingdom to Israel at that point in time, not Christianity, but he was offering the kingdom to Israel at that point in time. And over the next 40 years, Israel proved they didn't want it. They did not want to recognize Jesus as the Messiah. Therefore, in 70 AD, God just wiped the temple out. Jews have no place to worship now. And we, and we begin a full-blown church uh, um, age, of, uh, age of grace where we have the body of Christ, and we've just finished in 70 AD that, that, that uh, about nearly 40 years of transition period between the age of Israel and the age of grace. Now watch this. This phrase was spoken by Jesus while he was here on earth. Point number two right here. However, Jesus is now absent from the earth. You understand that? Where is he? He's seated at the right hand of God the Father. So now that he is absent, but guess what? While he is absent, he has left, he has left his mind. Stop right there. Jesus has left his mind, his mind, and where did he leave it? He left it behind. He ascended into heaven, but down here, he left us something, which is his mind, as our final authority today. Jesus is not present with us except he is omnipresent, but physically he is not with us. Therefore, in God the Father's plan, God the Father has left the mind of Christ behind us as our final authority today. So while you may hear, you'll be listening to a pastor teacher, you may be listening to a teacher, you may be listening to someone witnessing to you, giving you information, but here's the issue. G, the word of God is your final authority. And that's why in the book of Acts, guess what? What did the Bereans do? When they heard something, they went home and searched the scriptures to find out whether or not what they were being told is true. Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. It says, for who, that's any person, for who hath known the mind of the Lord? Stop here. Okay, so you're an unbeliever, you're walking through life, and you say, well, I think I got this thing whipped. Just so happens, nothing is going right in my life. So if nothing's going right in your life, you say, well, just a moment. I think that here's what I believe the plan of God is. And, and Paul is asking the Corinthians, for who among you, who among us today hath known the mind of the Lord? The answer to that question, for who's known the mind of the Lord? The answer is no one. That you who thinks they have the mind of the Lord, that they may instruct him. Can you imagine you, me, I, we trying to instruct God? Well, that's what Paul is indicating. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? 
Answer again, no one, not one person. But we, listen here, but we born again Christians, that too, that's who Paul's talking to here. But we born again Christians, what do we have? We have the mind of Christ. We have it. Jesus is not present. This is from the Bible class day in and day out. This is why we come to Bible class. We hear what the what the word of God is saying. Now look here, we're going to find out something about the Pharisees and the scribes. Hey, they were telling the people what the Bible said, but we're going to find out what they were doing to what the Bible said. Now, at this point in time, during the age of grace, that's right now, from, from the, once we finish the transition period in 70 AD, full-blown age of grace, okay? Only the message that Paul was preaching, and the only we're going to find the message, the mechanics, the mechanics of the Christian way of life are in the Pauline epistles, 13 epistles. That's where the mind of Christ is for you and me. Now, the, does the Bible have relevancy in the Old Testament, in Genesis? Does it have relevancy in Revelation? Does it have, re does it have relevancy in Matthew 23? Certainly it does. But the interpretation and the application, this is why we say, the word of God, it, 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 the rightly divided word of God. Study the rightly divided word of God. So here's the issue. During the age of grace, right now, the Pauline epistles are fundamentally the mind of Christ. Now let's go back up here in 1 Corinthians 2.16 again. Again, what we're doing is we're talking about what the Christian way of life is all about. We see that in this entire chapter, all the way down through 30, verse 39, Jesus is condemning religion. And if we don't know the distinction between religion and spirituality, we may be religious, not understanding what's going on in our life, why things are failing. We are here to resolve the spiritual battle called the angelic conflict, period, over and out. There is nothing else. It's more important than that. That is where our focus should be. So here is a principle. The principle is this. During the age of grace, the Pauline epistles are fundamentally the mind of Christ. Look back up to verse, verse 16 in chapter 2 of Corinthians. He says, for who hath known the mind of the Lord? Who's known it? No, not one person. You think you, ha you have the mind of Christ and you can instruct God? I don't, under I don't think so. But we born again Christians, we have the mind of Christ and the mind of Christ is found in the word of God. Look here, principle, in the absence of Jesus Christ from planet earth. Yes, he's absent. He's seated at the right hand of God the Father. And he was doing that 10 days before Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost. But here's the issue. He may be gone, but the final authority today is the word of God. Verse 9. In Matthew 23. Again, Jesus is addressing his disciples. And here's what he said. This, listen, listen, this is amazing. He said, do not call anyone. Uh-oh. Do not call anyone on earth your father. Now, hold on just a second. Don't get upset now. Don't, don't think ahead. Just listen to what it says. It says, do not call anyone on earth your father. For one, uh, guess what? Capital O again. I wonder what that means. If the word of God is rightly translated and you have a capital letter somewhere in the middle of the, of, of the sentence and where it's related to a pronoun, we're talking about a person of deity. So by interpretation, don't call, do not call anyone on earth for one, God the Father is your spiritual father. He is your father, which is your spiritual father. That's implied. He, God the Father, who is in the third heaven. So do not call, don't, don't call anyone the Father, and don't be called rabbi yourself. So what does this mean? Let's look at that phrase. Do not call anyone on earth your father. Now, first of all, what's oh, all good grief? I, I love my daddy. I love my daddy, but I guess I can't call him father anymore. I'm going to have to call him pops or, you know, hey, you or whatever. Look here, just a moment. This doesn't mean that you can't address your legal parent as father. Hey, father, father, 
father, I need you, father. There's, this does not, does not mean that you can't call your legal parent as father. The true meaning is that you should not call any religious religious leader by the name father. Excuse me, excuse me. This is what the scripture says. Do you have any illustration? I don't, I'm, this is a rhetorical question. I'm not asking you to answer it out loud, not asking you to turn on your mic, but I know that you have enough understanding about religion and the world and you might have you might just very quickly come to a point where you recognize someone as a religious leader that is being called father. Well, here's a principle. A religious a religious leader should never N E V E R should never be called father. Here's a rhetorical question. Do you have any contemporary illustrations of where this should be applied? problem talking about your legal parent somebody father but if it is a religious leader and for example if you're calling me father because i am am a religious leader i'm a i am a leader of the disciples the people that god brings into my periphery but i'm not i'm i'm not your i'm not your religious father no i'm not that so for is your for is your for your uh for one is your father which is in heaven. Now, here's what that means. God the Father is the author of the divine plan. What kind of plan is it that God the Father has authored? It is a grace-oriented plan. Wait a minute, just a second. Wow. I wonder if I understand what that means, grace-oriented. Well, we know that the word grace means God the Father's provision. And what that means is you don't have to work to get the prize. You don't have to work to get the benefit. That is for salvation. So God the Father is the divine plan, and his plan is in fact a grace-oriented plan. Point number two, no one, no one, N-O-O-N-E, no one other than God the Father has the right to be addressed as Father in a spiritual context. So in verse, in, in this verse, the word father refers to the first person of Godhead who alone holds absolute authority. Why? Because it is his plan. And number four, absolute authority over what? God the Father has absolute authority. It's okay. That's fine. Uh, so here's the issue. In my home, 21 St. Thomas Drive, I am in authority. I have authority. But guess what? I look over the fence and I see my neighbor's children doing something wrong, doing something bad. And I stick my head over the fence and I say, hey, stop that, stop that, stop that. And someone says, well, wait a minute. What, what right do you have to do this? Says, well, I have authority. Well, you have authority huh, on the other side of the fence. You don't have it in on this side of the fence. That is on the neighbor's side, okay? So that someone might say, okay, so you're telling me God the Father has authority. So what I want to know is what kind of authority does he have? Well, here it is. Absolute authority over what? God the Father has absolute authority over his plan. Oh, well, that's okay. I don't mess with that. Uh, no, no. His plan, you know, that's that's his plan. His, his, his plan is his plan. That's fine. But don't bother me with that plan. Well, here's the issue. If we don't understand what his plan, uh, what it comp uh, uh, what it uh, comprises, good gracious, we might just slough that thing off. So here's the issue. God the Father has an absolute authority over his plan. And the question is, what what does his plan cover? Well, let me see now. Let, uh, well, okay, so he's got a plan. Let's see, I, I, pray, you know, I don't know. It probably isn't worth a whole lot, you know, just a little old ditty thing over there. Excuse me. God the Father has author uh, absolute authority over his plan, and his plan covers the following periods. Uh-oh, hold it now. His plan covers the following periods. Eternity past. Hey, that's okay, man. That's, that is way back there. I don't know anything about that back there. Don't have anything to do with it. Well, just stop talking and listen, okay? So it's eternity past. It goes, you mean it goes beyond that? Certainly it does. It covers from beginning to end, from 
human history. From the time Adam was placed down here on this planet, from then till the great white throne judgment when Jesus has cast every unbeliever into the, into the eternal lake of fire, that is human history. So God the Father's plan covers everything in human history. Wait a minute, that's a long time. Eternity passed, let's see, what's that, a week or two? No, we don't know how long that was. Eternity has no beginning. It has no ending. So God the Father has complete authority. He had authority completely back in eternity past. He has it down here in human history from beginning to end during the age of grace for you and me and my lifetime, your lifetime. And whoops, hold it. Is it over then? No, it isn't. Because God, God the Father's authority continues into eternity future. Well, at what point in time in eternity future does God's authority end? What part of eternity do we not understand? So here's the issue. God the Father has a, a absolute authority over his plan. And the question is, when you stop and understand that, that God the Father has complete authority over his plan, the plan is designed for people like you and me, we, us, they, them, human beings. And if we're working in opposition to God's plan, if it's either in ignorance or we just flat outright rejecting it, we're outside God the Father's plan. We are we are going to get the attention getters to help us to understand, whoops, there's something wrong in your life. Now, isn't it interesting that many people think they're okay because they go to church, because they sing in the choir, because they preach, because they witness, because they but hold it now. You can do all that and still be religious. And Jesus in Matthew 23, speaking to the crowd and his disciples, is condemning religion. I was working on my computer. And I forgot to capitalize a letter. I was looking for something. I wanted to go out on the internet and go someplace. And when I was putting in the URL, I forgot to capitalize a word. Guess what? I didn't get where I was going. Why? Because it is a precisely correct procedure. See, that's what the protocol plan is. It is a it is a precisely correct procedure. So in ignorance, stupidity, I don't believe in the plan of God. You mean there's a plan of God? I didn't know that. So the issue is this. Anytime we're outside the plan of God, when we are supposed to be inside the plan of God, from the day we take our first breath. There are strong repercussions for failure to understand what life is all about. So God the Father, is in, he has absolute authority in eternity past, during human history, and eternity future, and we will be spending eternity with God the Father if, in fact, you're saved. So this little diagram, dotted line, eternity, past, eternity, future, and then human history with a solid line. So here's the issue. Anything. Hold it. I wonder what anything means. Mm. Anything and everything related to or associated with eternity past, human history, and eternity future is where God's authority is absolute. Isn't that amazing? So what that means then is when you take a look at the world and you see human beings all over the world in all kinds of religious backgrounds, or maybe no, ba no background at all. Maybe they're atheists. Maybe they haven't figured it out. Maybe they're agnostics. You got some Christians over there. All of the world religions, you could, listen, you can, you can look at a religion and see somebody with an ascetic trend or even a self-righteous legalistic approach to their religion doing all the right things and say, wow, they are spiritual. See, we don't define what spiritual is. God the Father's word defines what spiritual is. And there is a positional spirituality and there's an experiential spirituality. We as born again Christians are positionally spiritual, but the truth of the matter is millions and millions and millions of Christians across this planet, while they're positionally spiritual, they know nothing about the, about the experiential side of spirituality. There are all kinds of false, false means of achieving spirituality. 
but who hath known the mind of Christ that we may instruct him? The answer is no one, no one. But we, you, I, we, human beings, we have the mind of Christ. So what we need to do is go to the mind of Christ and find out what his plan is. Well, understanding Jesus is condemning religion. 2310, Jesus again addressing his disciples. He said, do not be called leaders. Do not be called leaders. Do not be called father. Do not be called rabbi. Do not be called leaders. That word leaders, we'll see what that means in just a moment. It's professors, but we'll see why. Why, do, why, don't, why don't you be called a leader or a professor? Here's the issue. He says, for one, here, this is Jesus Christ. In the previous, ver in the previous verse, don't be called father. There's only one father. That's God the Father. Here, don't be called leader, a professor. There's only one, and that's Jesus Christ, who is our leader. He's our professor. He's our teacher. And that one leader then is Christ. Now notice this. The word leader is a Greek word for professor. And in this interesting, while the word leader is a Greek word for professor, this is the only time in 2310, this is the only time this word is used in the New Testament. It is used only in connection with Jesus Christ. Well, I'm a professor. I graduated from college. I'm teaching over here. Excuse me. Excuse me. That's and that's in that realm. That's a secular realm. But in but in the Christian way of life, there is only one leader, and that is Christ. Point three here. The word leader is taken from a verb which means to guide according to a Norman standard. Whoa, hold it now. A guide, a guide according to a Norman standard. So what we have here then is Christianity, Christianity has a way of life. God the Father has given us a way of life. It's described by the mind of Christ in the Pauline epistles as to how we are to be living our Christian life. There's where the mechanics of the Christian way of life are. The how to. Oh, we teach, we teach the what. Oh yeah, this is what you do. This is what you do. Well, please. Tell me, how am I to do what I'm supposed to do? Well, here the word leader is taken from a verb which means to guide according to a Norman standard. So when Jesus, watch this now, Jesus is not present today. He was present back then. He was speaking to his disciples in the age of Israel. So when Jesus was physically present, there it is, when he was physically present on earth, he was the only one. You could say he was the only only one emphasizing the word only or you could say he was the only one emphasizing the word one meaning jesus is it when jesus was physically on planet earth he was the only one who could guide according to a spiritual norm and stand what standard why because he knew the truth he interpreted the truth correctly he could teach it correctly but here you have here you have uh, people who are called rabbis, who are the scribes and the Pharisees, who are the professors, the teachers at that point in time, and we'll find out what they were doing wrong. Wow. Telling the people right. Oh, yes. Yeah. Tell them right. Well, let's move on from there for just a moment. Now, Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father right now. Jesus is now seated at the right hand of God the Father. And we've already seen it is now the word of God that is our spiritual guide. Well, verse 11. Verse 11 says, <clears throat> again, Jesus is addressing his disciples. But the greatest, the greatest among you shall be your servant. Oh, hold it now. The greatest Jesus is speaking. He's speaking the age of Israel now. There is a secondary application out here in in the age of grace, Jesus is addressing his disciples who were Jews. And he said, but the greatest among you disciples, the greatest among you shall be your servant. Now, what does that phrase, the greatest among you mean? It refers to the person who constantly holds the position of spiritual leadership. Stop there now. The greatest among you. That's the person who constantly holds the position of spiritual leadership, not somebody just in and out, in and out, in and out, but constantly 
holds the position of spiritual leadership. So understand this. The person who holds the position of spiritual leadership becomes a servant. Wow. Hmm. I thought I was supposed to be a leader. Jesus says, no, you're a servant. Well, let's talk about this for a minute. The word greatest here means that the person who has the final authority. So the greatest among you. Well, the greatest among you is a servant. The greatest among you is the person who has the final authority. So the one who has final authority is a servant, okay? And here's what it says. That servant shall be your comforter. Well, we have a question then. If the greatest among you shall be your comforter, what or who is our comforter today? See, Jesus is talking to the disciples. That's in the age of Israel. But wait a minute. Secondary application. Do we have any leaders today? And if we do, where's the where's the authority? What does it mean to be a comforter? So we'll ask the question: who, what, or who is our comforter? Today, that means in the age of grace. That means today, December 29th, 2019. Who is our comfort today? Here's the answer. Our comfort must come from the word of God. And here's a truism. No pastor has the ability to comfort, comfort in all sorts of difficulties. You may come to me for an answer. You've got a question. I can answer your question but I don't have the ability to comfort you because the truth of the matter is comfort comes from the word of God. I teach the word of God. Pastor teachers teach the word of God. You communicate the word of God to your children, to your wife, to your husband, to your boss, to your friends, to your boyfriend, to your girlfriend. You, you communicate the word of God, but the communicator is not the comforter. It is the word of God that is the comforter. So no pastor has the ability to comfort in all sorts of difficulties. Truism point number three, the way to receive comfort is through the word of God. So what happens is the word of God, many people, many people are, they're, ang they're anxious. They're filled with anxiety. They're filled with depression. They're filled with frustration. They're looking for answers. And it's not until it's not John who comes by. It's not Billy who comes by. It's not Martha or Betty or Sue that comes by. It's the person who comes by with the word of God that is quoted correctly, interpreted correctly, received by the one who needs comfort, applied by the one who needs comfort to find the comfort that they're looking for. So here's the, here's the reality. Unbelievers and believers alike, too many persons, unbelievers and believers alike, neither practice nor believe this. Listen to what I just said. I said too many persons, unbelievers, you come to somebody and say, look, you're frustrated, you're depressed, you're anxious, you're, your life is a mess, and you don't know why. I'm going to tell you why. You need to be born again. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's where your comfort begins. You will find no comfort. It will be transient if you are an unbeliever and you're using something other than God the Father's plan. And guess what? You're, oh no, I'm, com I, I found it. I found it for a day. You found it to someone else, some, something else goes haywire. You found it until something else happens. Now all of a sudden you're back in the same old boat you were before. Why? Because there is no human solution that will bring the peace and the comfort and the, 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 the wonder of God's plan for our lives. The happiness that we are searching for. There is no way to get that except through the word of God. Pastors don't have the ability to comfort. They give you the word of God. That's the comfort, if in fact you believe it. So the second truism here, the way to receive comfort is through the word of God. You must hear it. You, it's got to come through the ear gate, eye gate, or tackling. It's got to, it's got to come in. Once it gets in the frame of reference, if you're clean before the Lord, guess what? Bingo! Down into the human spirit it goes. Now the Holy Spirit's going to act on that. It's an active, an active ministry of the Holy Spirit to teach, to bear witness, to confirm. And as soon as He's done that, bingo! 
right back up into the frame of reference again. And you have to say, I understand what the Spirit of God just taught me. And I believe it. And you cycle it down. You put it in a closed closet and never get it out. So you go to the spiritual ball, you go to the spiritual royal, royal ball, and you go in blue jeans, you go in dungarees, you go in holy clothes. That's that's that, that's not uh, you know, holes with clothes, clothes with holes in them. You go to the ball. That's the ambassador walking around in in the in Christian way of life. The amba the royal ambassador walking around doing the right thing in the wrong way or doing the wrong thing in the wrong way, believing that wow. God should bless my life, but you still have no comfort because you've done the right, the wrong thing in the wrong way or the right thing in the wrong way. So this is why I say the word of God is our comforter, the word of God. It's not your wife. It's not your husband. It's not some psychologist, some psychiatrist. It's not somebody else out here. It's the word of God. And that's why I say reality, too many persons, believers and unbelievers alike do not believe what I just said. The word of God is where you find your comfort. I'm telling you, I find, I find, I find a multitude, multitude of believers who don't believe that. They simply go to, what do we call the, go to church. No, you don't go to church. You are the church and you function on God's word. And there's nothing else that will give you the peace that God wants to give you. So in verse 12, we see the perspective of grace. The perspective of grace is continued. Remember, eight, one through one through seven. Jesus was speaking, but in verses eight through eight through eleven, we had uh, a, a we had a, a, a parentheses where Jesus is the focus of God the Father's plan. Now we go back and pick up in verse twelve with the perspective of grace continued. Verse twelve says, "Whoever." That means anyone seeking leadership. So here, and this, listen, this is this is the area where, uh, where, uh, as a as a young pastor starting out in Stuttgart, listen, God led me to Stuttgart. God, uh, God led me to Little Rock, two Southern Baptist churches. I understand that. I'm not bad mouthing. I'm not complaining. God used those two situations in a five year period of time, from 1970 to 1975. He was teaching me what not to do. So it took five years to learn the direction I really needed to go. That was 1975. And I'm telling you, as I look into, as I look into this camera right now, I'm telling you, I am still learning. I'm still peeling the onion. There's, there's still things down hidden in my life. I'm not hiding them. They're down, they're down in my life. That is the it's the core of the, the core reason of why I do this or why I do that. And when I finally look up alert and aware, I realize that, wow, that isn't right. I've been doing that wrong. And now you get you the, the illumination takes place. You have that moment where you realize, wow, this isn't right. And then you, you take that and you turn it around and you use the you apply the word of God and you find peace in that area. So here's the perspective of grace. Whoever, that's anyone seeking leadership, whoever exalts him. See, this is why when I was in North Maple Baptist Church, when I was in when I was in uh, the church in, in Little Rock, prior to the Bible Doctrine Church in Little Rock, while I was in a denominational setting, I was being told and taught the way up is to the bigger church. It's through more money, through more income. It is through it is through more numbers, greater numbers. It is through um, through more baptisms. It is see what oh listen. This is where this is where when you go to the convention, when you go to the meeting, you say, oh I hear yeah here I am yeah I well, sure enough I excuse me. Jesus said, whoever exalts himself, and that means seeking approbation. And by the way, you can do the same thing on Facebook. You put something on Facebook, and then you you can't you can't wait till somebody likes it. You can't wait till somebody puts. That doesn't mean Facebook is wrong. Hold it now. Facebook is neutral. It's what we do to Facebook that makes makes it wrong. 
So here we're using Facebook for a good reason. It's teaching the word of God. You go out there and you find somebody making some, some filthy statements. You see somebody out there, some woman out there glorifying her body and telling you, hey, you know, uh, if you pick, click on this link, you'll see me nude or what you get my nude pictures. I don't care about nude pictures. I want to use the word of God. I want to use the word of God not to not to curse, not to malign, not to criticize you or anybody else. I want to get the word of God out so if there's somebody out there that has a desire to know Jesus in a personal way and to see the blessings in time and the reward in eternity and the glorification of the Father, you'll know how to do it. But watch this. If you're exalting yourself, uh -huh, whoever exalts himself or herself, what are they doing? They're seeking approbation. They're seeking approval, not just from God, but for your wife, from your husband, your children, your, your family, your neighbor, your boss. Whoever exalts himself shall be humbled. And you know what that word humble there means? Whoever exalts himself will, will understand a sense of failure. When you're trying to exalt yourself, it isn't going to work. And it's not long before you, you begin to realize I have failed. This isn't the way, this isn't where it is. But Jesus turns right around and says, and whoever humbles himself, that's anyone, male, female, black, white, rich, poor, educated, uneducated, whoever humbles themselves. And that word humble there actually by application means functioning in the sphere of the spirit. So when you are functioning in the sphere of the spirit, guess what you've done? You have humbled yourself. You've given yourself over to the only authority that makes any sense, and that's God and his word. So anyone who exalts himself or herself shall experience a sense of failure. Whoever humbles himself, functions in the sphere of the spirit, according to God's plan, that is, shall be exalted. What's it mean to be exalted? It means to be blessed in time and rewarded in eternity. So whoever exalts himself, this refers to anyone who seeks the position of leadership to fulfill power, praise, or approbation lust. Power lust, praise lust, approbation lust. Whoever exalts himself, what's he gonna do? That person, male or female, shall be humbled. And hear that word humbled? Here this word indicates depressed, and the sense of disappointment. Oh, I, I found my way to the top, and guess what? It is empty. Disappointment, frustration. And here's the issue. No lust pattern, no pattern of lust. Sex lust, approbation lust, potential lust, whatever. No lust pattern is able to provide satisfaction, period. No, uh, satisfaction is permanent satisfaction. Oh, you're satisfied for three minutes. As soon as it gets dark, as soon as she leaves, as soon as the money goes, hey, guess what? You're back in the same old boat. Then he goes on to say, whoever humbles himself, this is the principle of Operation Grace. What does that mean? Whoever humbles himself, Operation Grace. What is that? Operation Grace means the following. Operation Grace means you're oriented to the plan of God. You know what the plan of God is. You're born again. Save faith alone in Christ alone. Now you're in phase two of the Christian way of life. You're wanting to live out the Christian way of life, but you have to make sure that after salvation, you are clean before the Lord where you have confessed any post salvation sin you may have committed. At the same time, once you confess that sin, you need to know how to get in the sphere of the spirit because that's where the Christian way of life is to be lived. That's where the entirety of life is to be lived in the sphere of the spirit. So what does this mean, whoever humbles himself? That means a person who is oriented to the plan of God and utilizing divine operating assets. That's exactly what it means, okay? So let's move on from there now. The phrase to be, uh, so whoever humbles himself, living in the sphere of the spirit, shall be exalted. And shall be exalted actually means shall be rewarded. And here's the principle. You and I, we believers, we who operate on the principle of grace, uh-oh, guess what? We will be rewarded. And what is the application of that? The application of that is this. When the believer functions in the sphere of the spirit, that's where you and I are to be, be functioning. When we are functioning in the sphere of the spirit as born-again Christians, the believer, you, I, we, we produce divine good. And guess what? Divine good is rewardable. 
That is, the believer receives reward for divinely good production. You are functioning as a royal ambassador. You are producing. You're doing the right thing in the right way. And guess what? As a servant, you're producing divine good, and divine good is blessed in time and rewardable in eternity. But hey, we're talking about religion. We're trying to help people understand you don't need to be religious. You shouldn't be religious. It's, it's an absolute abomination to God the Father, whose plan it is. So in verses 13 through 33, guess what? We're going to see the seven woes. So in the last five and a half, less, uh, the last five minutes, let's take a look at verse 13. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. Here again, Jesus is speaking to the, scri uh, speaking to the scribes and Pharisees at this, at this point in time. We're back in the age of Israel. It's got a secondary application to you and me today. He says, but woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you, scribes and Pharisees, what are you doing? You shut off the kingdom of heaven. You're shutting off the kingdom of heaven. How are you shutting it off? We'll see that shortly. But those scribes and Pharisees were shutting off the kingdom of heaven from people. That's the Jews who were positive at the point of God consciousness. That's important here. The people who are getting shut off by the scribes and Pharisees, who are people who are walking around in Israel in the, in the presence of scribes and Pharisees, who were the leaders, who were the, who were the teachers, who were the professors, were teaching the word of God. They were teaching, the, they were teaching the, the Judaistic principles. They were teaching Codex 1, Codex 2, and Codex 3 of the Mosaic law. But what they were doing in their teaching, they were, they were, they were hiding, they were obscuring the kingdom of heaven from these people so that these people could not enter in. But yet these were people who are not, un, not just unbelievers going out there. These are, believer, these are unbelieving Jews who are actually seeking. They knew there was a God out there. They wanted to know that God. They wanted to know more about him. So they were positive at the point of God consciousness as opposed to a Jew who was not positive at the point of God consciousness. And so these scribes and Pharisees in their preaching and their teaching, they were hiding, they were shutting off the kingdom of heaven. The door was closed, they locked it from people. For you, you scribes and Pharisees, not only are you locking them out, but guess what you're doing? You have already locked yourself out. For you scribes and Pharisees, you do not enter in, you don't enter into that spiritual kingdom yourselves nor do you allow those who are entering to go into that spiritual kingdom. Let's talk about this for just a moment. That phrase, woe to you. This phrase is used seven times in the passage of Matthew 23, 13 down through 39. Used seven times, woe to you. Well, what does that word woe mean? That word woe is an interjection. Woo! You know, it's, wow, they get you and sort of jam you real good. Woe is an interjection of calamity. When he says, woe, you need to perk up. You need to see what's going on. And he says, woe to you. Who is you? You refers to the scribes and Pharisees, the leaders and professors of Judaism. By application, it's to me. It's to every pastor teacher on the planet. It's to every Sunday school teacher. It's every person who has the gift of teacher who's out there communicating. That refers to you who's witnessing to somebody out here. You hypocrites. And this is why we say today, time and time again, that when you look at the church today, listen, do you know, it's amazing. The number of people who have left the church are leaving the church. Why? Because they look at the church, they say, there's not one thing in there that's helping me. I can sing till Jesus comes. I can pray till Jesus comes. I can go to Sunday school class. I can do this, I can do that. But it isn't helping me. Why? Because you're being told one thing and you're not being told how to do it. So what happens? By claiming to be a Christian, you should be living the Christian way of life and you're nothing more than, I'm not talking to you, not, not, pointing direction at you who are online. You, listen, if a shoe fits, wear it. I'm talking in general. You have to apply it for yourself. He calls them hypocrites. And these are people who speak from behind a wax face, people hiding behind a mask. On the outside, you think you say you're one thing, but inside, there's the reality. So both groups of religious leaders, the scribes and Pharisees, are called hypocrites, people who cover their face, 
they're saying one thing and doing something else. And here's what he says of those scribes and Pharisees. Here's what he's saying to many pastors today. And this is why as a pastor, I need to take a look at myself. Am I shutting you off from the kingdom of heaven? Am I shutting you off from the blessings of God? Because I'm teaching the word of God and misinterpreting it. So he says, you shut off. This means keep it. Actually, the Greek actually means you keep shutting off. It's not just a one-time deal. They keep shutting it off because they're saying the same thing. The scribes and Pharisees kept on doing this. Shutting off was their habit. Very quickly now, the kingdom of heaven. What is that? We need to understand. They're shutting off the kingdom of heaven. You and I need to understand something right here. When you talk about the kingdom of heaven, you're talking about Israel. Oh, the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom. We're talking about the kingdom, which is the millennial kingdom. But this kingdom of heaven here, there are two kingdoms in scripture. One is spiritual, the other is physical. So what happens here, by teaching the way these, these scribes and Pharisees are teaching, they're giving them the word of God, but they're misinterpreting the law so that they believe that keeping the law will save them. And as a result of that, they will not enter into the spiritual kingdom. And what is the spiritual kingdom? The spiritual kingdom is the kingdom into which all believers in every dispensation of time will be a part. A spiritual kingdom, born again. But the physical kingdom is the millennium. And Jesus is telling the scribes and Pharisees here, you are keeping people from entering the kingdom of heaven. You are hindering people from getting saved because you're teaching the law, Codex 1, Codex 2, and Codex 3, but you're misinterpreting it. You're saying what to do, but you're, you're saying it wrong. And so what happens, you're shutting off the kingdom of heaven from people. And the Pharisees, the Pharisees legalistic message of salvation by works blurred the God the Father's message of salvation by grace. The result of point number one, the Pharisees' message closed the door to the spiritual kingdom of heaven to anyone who accepted their message because they were saying the right thing but misinterpreting. Here's the principle. A false message cannot and will not achieve the results of God the Father, the God the Father intends. Phase one, his intention is you get saved. Phase two, you be blessed in time. Phase three, you're rewarded in heaven. But a false message will keep you from getting any of that. For you, the Pharisees, you do not enter yourselves. What's he saying? He said, the Pharisee, you, need, you and I need to understand, the Pharisees were unbelievers. So they're applying their own message to themselves. Therefore, they do not enter the spiritual kingdom themselves. They can't because they're not going in the right way. And here's why. The reason, because the only way to enter God the Father's spiritual kingdom is faith alone in Christ alone. And here's what he says. Nor do you, scribes and Pharisees, allow those, to, uh, those who are entering in entering to go in. The two most important questions in life at the point of God consciousness, the first, the first important question is to do what you, I'm sorry, at the point of God consciousness, the first important question is, do you want more information about God? And if you do, if you want more information about God at the point of God consciousness, the second question is, have, having heard the gospel of Christ, do you believe the gospel that you have heard? I'm going to stop right here. We'll pick up all this tomorrow because there are four more points, but I'll just pick up with, uh, with this verse and move on to, into something new at that point in time. God bless you. I thank you for being with me two or three minutes over time. But uh, please understand, religion is out. Jesus is condemning religion in the entire chapter 23. And it gets worse and worse and worse as we go down through this chapter. God bless you, and thank you for being with me. Father, thanks this morning for the privilege of taking a look at this uh, passage about uh, uh, religion, Jesus condemning it. Uh, th that's fine that he condemns it, but what we need to know is what is it? What is it? How does it manifest itself? Am I involved in it in any kind of a way? I don't want to be, Father. We don't want to be. We don't need to be. The angelic conflict is the focus of our life. Well, with that in mind, Father, thank you for the opportunity to preach and teach again today. Thank you for all the folks who have logged on. I love every one of them passionately, and I have a desire that they see the truth and know it. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, folks. I'm going to go, go ahead and close all this down, and we'll be back on um, tomorrow night at 7, uh, 7 o'clock picking up right where we left off right here. God bless you.